Hello, here's a video that will introduce lateral torsional buckling and uh, I'll try to get through a calculation for an unrestrained steel beam uh, subject to lateral torsional buckling using the SCI Blue Book. So uh, first of all, what is lateral torsional buckling? Well, let's, um, I'll just give a kind of simple introduction. First of all, by looking at a, a beam supporting a UDL, which deflects, and then lo and behold, there's compression on the top and tension on the bottom. Okay, so for a typical I-beam, the top flange would be in compression and the bottom in tension. And there it is, in compression, and that's in tension. Right, well anything, any member in compression is liable to buckling. Mm. Okay, so if the top flange is actually um, represented by that ruler there, then it's quite liable to buckle, if I buckle that, um, up or down, right, uh, but it can't because it's restrained by the web and the flange, so it's, the only way it can buckle is to buckle side by side, so it's going to buckle side by side, and um, because of that, if I take a typical, typical strut that's in buckling, I can apply Euler's critical, uh, well, Euler, Euler's analysis of this and find out the critical buckling load. Well, that, that's good. That's a that's a nice thing to know. P crit. Um, what else do I uh, need to consider? What else do I need to know? Well, to 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 use this, I have to use uh, this factor L, which is the effective length of the member. So, what is the effective length? Well, the effective length of a member is the length of an equivalent pin-ended member that has the same buckling resistance. So for instance, the effective length of a uh, this piece of spaghetti, which is fixed at each end, is I'm exerting a certain compressive load to create that buckling. The effective length, it would be a piece of spaghetti the same size but that was pinned at each end and now I'm exerting exactly the same size and that's buckling very nicely Ex exactly the same uh, load right uh, so what are these effective lengths? well for uh, a pin ended member you'll never guess but because it's already pinned at each end the effective length is going to be its original span length for one that's something that's fixed fixed it's 0.7 times the original S uh, span uh, something that's pinned and fixed, pinned and fixed, it's somewhere in between, lo and behold, 0.85 S. Great. Uh, how about a member that's uh, particularly long, this one is 2 S long, but at its centre, I've, um, I've now fixed it, sorry, restrained it in position, but not in direction. And you can see that this is a potential buckling shape, and so the effective length of this, it would be just like buckling, a, a member that was length uh, S or the L is going to equal to S. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Right, what else do we have to look at when we're considering um, buckling? Well, uh, lateral torsional buckling. Well, if I take a, a tension member, there you go, I'll apply some tension to this elastic band and then I try and distort it out of position. Well, when I remove, when that member tends to return to its original position. Okay. So for a beam that's undergoing lateral torsional buckling, it tends to uh, it has a load which generally tends to give it some vertical deflection. The top flange wants to buckle outwards. The bottom flange wants to stay where it is, and so we have this kind of it comes down and it goes around, and because of this this kind of turning of it, we call it torsional in its buckling, and it's a lateral movement, so it's lateral torsion and buckling. Right, well, if I take a, a member, oh here's, a, here's another, another diagram showing some lateral torsion and buckling, I don't know if that makes it any clearer, that's from a textbook. Right. Now, if I want to um, calculate uh, how, how, how good a member can resist this lateral torsion and buckling, I also have to consider the bending moment diagram. Because if I have a member that's, that has a compression force in it over a very small length, it's not very likely to buckle. Whereas if that compressive force is a 
applied over a much longer length, it's going to buckle more easily. So, bear in mind that the compression in the top flange is dependent on the size of the bending moment diagram. Let's have a look at these bending moment diagrams. They vary from constant through to um, a, a typical parabola for a UDL and then for this situation, fixed fixed with a point load in the middle, I've drawn the bending moment on the tension face. Well, the bending moment, the top flange is only in compression for a quite a short length of that beam. So even though the, the top flange is in compression for the entire length here, it's much reduced here. And the way that your, the Euro code deals with this is it gives different bending moment shapes uh, a factor C1, which um, is, forms part of the um, design for laterally um, unrestrained beams. So the, the worst case is a factor of C1, and one of the better cases would be 1.68. It actually goes beyond two and beyond two and a half, but there we go. If you want to be conservative in life, take a factor of C1. All right. Where do you find out about these bending moment shapes? Well, the Euro code doesn't actually give you that, but I've taken this table from the textbook. There's the textbook, structural element design. Good textbook. Uh, very intelligent and concise, so I, I like that textbook. The, uh, here are all the different uh, C1 factors for bending. So, one of the key steps in finding the design buckling resistance of a uh, beam is to calculate the elastic critical buckling moment. There's a crack of an equation in the Euro code, but you can see that from what we've just been discussing, it actually breaks down into quite sensible parts. It's got one part, C1, that relates to the bending moment shape factor. It's got another part here that relates to Euler and the elastic critical buckling load. And then finally, there's a part here that has a number of factors that relate to how easy it is to twist the beam to its side and pull it, uh, pull it out of shape that way. So it's got different uh, constants, and all of these constants in here relate to the... Um, the stiffness of the beam and its ability to resist uh, the, the buckling. Okay, so because of that, and because the shear modulus and elastic modulus of steel remains the same, whether it's grade 275 or S355, then this value for M crit is the same for both grades of steel, because it's dependent on stiffness, not strength. All right, so I think right now, we could do, we could launch into uh, an example. This example is taken from another vid video on laterally restrained beams. So I've taken exactly the same loading and spans. Uh, what we need to do is to calculate the ultimate limit state loading. I'll just clean up the decks a little bit here. So calculate the ultimate limit state loads, which I've factored up my dead and live loads and apply them to the beam and also I want to know my unfactored live load so I can check my deflections. The way I've calculated them and the way I've calculated my design bending moment, and shear force and uh, required I value is shown in the video for laterally restrained beams. Okay, once you've got this information, if you're going to do a hand calculation, the way to do it would be to uh, follow the Euro code if you design it to the Euro code and you have to calculate the elastic critical buckling moment, uh, some slenderness, some buckling parameters and reduction factors and finally uh, you pop out with the design buckling resistance moment. Your primer for this is to find the effective length and choose your C1 factor. Now if you're going to use the blue book method uh, you still have to work out the effective length in the C1 factor and then you just turn to the blue book and uh, you look up the buckling resistance moment. So um, now's a good time to do, to do just that. Here's the beam summarised and here are its design values. So section properties and shear, just the same as for a restrained beam, buckling resistance moment, look it up in the blue book. Well. In order to make use of the uh, blue book and these tables, I need to know uh, a couple of uh, couple of factors. I need to know the C1 factor, um, 
and it's a, a UDL with pin support with parabolic bending moment. So I can check that from my table, which you must get from the textbook, something like that. And here we are, a parabolic bending moment, C1 is 1.13. That's what I've taken. Now for effective length, uh, again it's pin supported, so I pin at each end. So the effective length is its actual length, 10 meters, 10 meters. Now, so now for the, uh, the SCI blue book. Uh, well, you can buy it for £80 in the SCI shop, but I'll be using the, um, the online interactive version. I type in Steel Construction Info into Google, click on the link steelconstruction.info, and that takes me to the Steel Construction um, Encyclopedia online. I go to the key resources, make use of the blue book key resource. That brings me to the Blue Book web page, which has got uh, the introductory video, PDF link, and a link to the interactive Blue Book, which I'm going to use. So I'll click on that. That brings me through to the, uh, the home page for the Blue Book, and I'm trying to find a beam, a universal beam. And so, uh, because I'm expecting that the buckling resistance moment to be the governing um, factor, I'm going to search for the buckling resistance moment first. So I'm going to click through on uh, buckling resistance moment for S355 and here is the uh, buckling resistance moment uh, chart for universal beams. I've previously looked for the uh, buckling resistance moments for a number of beams and I found that the UB 533 by 312 by 151 is about right so I now need to select my C1 value and my effective length. Well my C1 value is 1.13 and then I can scroll along here till I get to an effective length of 10 meters and that's going to give me the buckling resistance moment and I can see that that's 813 kilonewton meters. That's good. That's more than the um, design moment of 638. Next I need to check out the uh, uh, design shear resistance for that section. So 533, 312, 151 has got design shear resistance of 1460 kilonewtons. Next I'm going to check for the uh, I value for this um, this beam and uh, from the calcs I know I need a, an I value of 35,714 well a 533, 312, 151 that's got enormous I value of 101,000 uh, that's all the information I need from the blue book at the moment and back to my calculations very good so the buckling resistance moment in the blue book has been found together with the shear and uh, second moment of area and this is found to be okay. You can see that for an S275 beam the values are slightly reduced but not greatly reduced and so this, this beam actually works in both S275 and S355. Here's another beam just in case you want to try out a different section, this one's 610 deep just check out the values in the blue book as before. Now, really what we want to do is to produce a calculation at the end of this. So here's my calculation where I um, note all the loads, describe the beam, do a little diagram to help people understand that, and then I calculate the, the uh, design moment, shear, and requirement for um, an I value, for the strong axis I value. And then I simply look up in the blue book, suggest a section, check it in the U-book, and then confirm what I've gone for. Um, that's the end of the video. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Cheerio.